Okay, tonight, uh, just four verses, Matthew 8, 14 to 17. And I entitled tonight's uh, section, tonight's passage, just checking over the chat stream here, okay, uh, entitled it, He Took Up Our Infirmities. And the full quote is from verse 17 of our section tonight, He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. That's Matthew's summary of what Jesus was doing here and why. But what does it mean? How does Jesus take up our infirmities? In what ways, in what way does he bear our diseases? And what does this mean for us as we live in a world full of infirmity and disease? Now we touched on this each of the last couple of weeks, but we're going to look at it from slightly different angles on it um, tonight. And we will in future weeks as well because we have more healing miracles to come. And each one teaches us something. That's why the Spirit included it in the Bible. Okay, tonight we are looking at the healing of Peter's mother-in-law in Capernaum. And let's, let's look at the first two verses of that. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her, and she got up and began to wait on him. Okay, that's our, our passage, first part of our passage for tonight. And there's, there's several things about this um, that I want to talk about. And uh, I'm going to put that aside. I'll, I'll bring that back up again as we need it. But um, here's the first thing. Structurally... This is the, the third miracle of the first group of three miracles. Now, now, I said this a couple of weeks ago, that Matthew has arranged this miracle section in three groups of three or four miracles, with teaching on discipleship in between these groups, and then it's followed by a big teaching on discipleship and Jesus sending out, picking the 12, and, and so forth. So Matthew's structure is very well planned out and, and teaches us things just by the way he lays out his gospel, how he chooses which, which healing miracle to include at what point. Um, I want to I wanna mention here a... Um, I'm going to put in a plug, an advertisement for, for some things. Some of you are, are familiar with this. There's a, a video multi mini series that's being put together called The Chosen. Uh, you might have seen it advertised, especially if you're on social media. Uh, the Chosen is the life of Christ from the perspective of those who followed him. And there's two seasons so far. It's very well done fleshing out the scriptural story but honoring the text. And it's made by Christians in order to share the gospel. It's also a, it's available on DVD, it's available, I forget where else online, but uh, it's crowdfunded. That means they're, they're, people are donating um, and that's how they're, they're getting it funded because Hollywood's not interested, <laughs> okay? But it's really well made. The portrayal of Matthew is fascinating. Uh, he's a young man, and, and there's something off about Matthew in the way he's portrayed. Not in a negative, not in a bad way, but whether it's OCDC or, 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 or OCD, I'm sorry, or, or Asperger's or, or something, something on the autism spectrum. But everything has to be neat and in order, meticulous. And he's very, 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 uh, very much <laughs> uh, that way. Well, this is where they got the idea from how well laid out his gospel is and how meticulously it's planned. So anyway, I encourage you if you haven't already, if you need if you have questions about the chosen where to get it, you know, talk to me. It's really good. Anyway, um, this is what I mean about Matthew's laying it out. Okay. The the first three miracles are really like approaching the temple. Okay? Let me, let, me, let me put it down this way. Okay, the first miracle that we looked at a couple weeks ago, the healing of the leper. The leper is unclean. He is unable to come to the Temple Mount at all. He can't even come into the city. Uh, but Jesus 
breaks down that barrier. He reaches out, touches the leper, he heals him, he removes that barrier. Okay? Last week's miracle, the second miracle, a centurion, a Gentile. Well, as you approach the temple, okay, you got in the gates now, leper. You're approaching the temple now. The first thing you come to is the court of the Gentiles. Gentiles could come this far toward the temple, but no further. Well, Jesus broke down that barrier uh, by offering to come into the Gentiles' house. Well, he didn't do that. Uh, the centurion said, no, you don't have to. But he healed the man, sharing uh, the blessings of the kingdom uh, with, with a Gentile. Let's see, I want to share this. Now, look at this. Here, here's a drawing of the Temple Mount. I don't know how well you can see that, depending on how big your screen is. Um, but once again, you know, here's, here's the wall. Okay, the leper's out here. And the leper's way out there. And then look what you got around the temple. The temple there is in the actual center here. It says the inner court. And then to the, to the right of it there, it says the court of the Gentiles. Okay, so the Gentiles could go no further. Now, can you see um, next to the temple itself, where it says the inner court, Right above that, what it says? The court of the women. Okay? That's the next barrier as we approach the temple. The court of the women. So what happens in the third miracle? Okay? We have a woman. See how, see how well laid out Matthew does this. Okay, so the, the, the court of the women. Let's talk about that. Um, women were allowed this far and no further. Men could go further, women were not allowed. This was reflected also in the synagogues by having the women either outside the synagogue or in the back uh, behind a screen even. Uh, women were at this time in Israel's history were, were half caste in ancient Israel. And one of the, one of the 18 prayers uh, pay, prayed by pious Israelite males each day was a prayer of thanks that he was not born a woman. Okay, this is not biblical. This is not in the Old Testament. There was no court of the women in the tabernacle or Solomon's temple. It's a second temple. It's an it's a after the exile thing, and it, it was prominent in Herod's temple. It's reflecting the culture at the time, and there was more separation between men and women. And the whole thing when the synagogues, the women being outside or behind a curtain, that's not in the Bible. Okay. But anyway, Jesus is in a time when there's a lot of, a lot of separation um, with women. He breaks that down. He, he touches her. He touched. Let's let's look at that. Let's let's look at that again. Put that back up there. Okay. He look at that verse fifteen. He touched her hand, and the fever left her. And she got up and began to wait on them. Okay. Uh, this is the same thing we have been seeing from Matthew throughout his gospel. Jesus came for all. It was in the genealogy and the people that he included, especially the women, the Magi, uh, the, the Galilee, which had lots of Gentiles, the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit. And now these successive healings, as the healings represent an, a, an approach to the temple and, and the breaking of the barriers. Well, what happens? Preview, spoiler alert. What happens when Jesus dies? What does Matthew point out? The final barrier falls, the curtain inside the temple. All are welcome to the Holy of Holies. All are welcome to the presence of God. Every barrier removed because of Christ. Now this takes an even deeper meaning when you keep in mind that Jesus himself, he calls himself the temple. So it's stuff we'll be talking about later, but it's really amazing. Amazing. Okay, Matthew has um, also gone out of his way to, um, to emphasize there is no magic formula um, like you'd find in pagan religions. There's no certain ritual 
having to say the right words to have enough faith to conjure healing. No. Look, look at the way Matthew describes these three miracles we've seen so far. The first miracle, the leper, the sick person asked for help himself, right? The leper says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. The second miracle, it's not the sick person, it's an intercession. The centurion asks on behalf of his servant, okay? The third miracle, nobody asks. Look how Matthew tells that again. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her. Nobody asked. Jesus just did it. He just healed her because he wanted to. You know, I need to point this out. I mean, it all depends. I mean, we talked about this with the healing of the leper. It all depends on the will of God. We pray and we intercede because God has promised to hear. And, and this exercise of our trust in God, that's a prayer is, it's putting our faith into life, is what Jesus wants to work in us above all. That's why prayer is so important as a living of our faith. But I just need to point this out because there is a lot of false teaching out there about healing, especially from some of the so-called faith healers you know, where, where it's dependent on the level of our own faith to kind of activate God's healing. No. Jesus is not a, a reluctant Savior who has to be cajoled and bribed into hearing our prayers and answering. He's eager. He's watching. And often blesses when we haven't even thought to ask, as we see here with Peter's mother-in-law. Okay, what happens? Let's put it up there one more time. What happens when he heals her? Verse 15, he touched her hand, the fever left her, and she got up and began to wait on him. Okay, began to wait on him. This is, this is interesting as well, uh, that, that this is the response. Once again, Matthew intentionally, you know, under re leadership of the Holy Spirit, included that detail. She began to serve Jesus. Now notice, what he says, she began to, um, to, to wait on him. She didn't like run off and join a convent or a spiritual commune like the Essenes in the desert, Qumran. Um, she didn't build a huge temple or anything dramatically uh, religious. She began to wait on him. She brought him some food, you know, brought him a drink. Um, cared for his basic needs, served him in an ordinary way, in ordinary life. This is something about where our, our service to Jesus begins. It's not about the super religious showy things. It's in everyday life we have the chance to respond to his blessing with service and serving him, waiting on him as we wait on others, as we serve others. So Matthew is, is teaching us by including this in his account. We respond to Jesus by waiting on him, serving him in our lives every day, and that's done most uh, clearly <laughs> by serving others. Okay, that is the first two verses. Let's go on. Oh, I wanted to show something. I almost forgot about this. Peter's house, where this took place, um, archaeologists are, are feel pretty confident in thinking they found the location. Now, this is not the, the ruins of Peter's house. It's the, it's the site that they believe Peter's house was, which, which means it was, would have been where Jesus lived when, um, when he was in Capernaum. This is, these are the ruins of a Byzantine church built on top of it. Uh, in the fourth century, um, Helena, the mother of Constantine went to the Holy Land and she identified, and we don't know exactly how accurate it was, she identified certain locations from the life of Christ and churches were built on them. And so the foundations in the archeology span work that's been done on this site has led them to be pretty sure this is where Peter's house was. So anyway, a little information there. Okay, let's go on then. Verse 16 and 17. 
when evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. Okay, we're going to talk about this one verse at a time. Verse, uh, verse, verse uh, 16, about the demon-possessed and healing them. Okay. Now, um, before that, though, I want to talk about that they came to him um, in the evening. Why, why, why do they wait in the evening? Well, Matthew doesn't tell us. He just gives us little, this little, little tidbit of information. Um, now, this incident is recorded in Mark and Luke as well. Mark fleshes it out a bit, uh, but they both point out that this happened on the Sabbath. Jesus went to Peter's home after being in the synagogue. And since it was the Sabbath, the people didn't go out except to the synagogue. The Pharisees had taught them, and I'll point out incorrectly, that Sabbath meant you can only take so many steps. So everybody waited till the sun went down, and that was the start of a new day um, and how they reckoned the days. So now it's no longer Sabbath, so now they can go walking around, and so they all went to Peter's house uh, to see Jesus and ask for healing. So and that Matthew didn't consider that little detail that it was a Sabbath important for what he wanted to. He didn't want that to. I think I think he didn't want that to obscure what he, the point he was making about the progressive healing. Um, but he still points out that it was in the evening. So that's what's going on. So Jesus spent his evening doing healing. And the, this is the first time that we have mentioned in Matthew's gospel the casting out of demons, um, healing the demon possessed. We're going to see more of it later. Um, but I'm just going to point, and we'll talk more about it then. There's one of the miracles uh, coming up in a bit is casting out a demon. So we'll, we'll talk about that on that week. But I'll just point out here that Matthew points out that he cast them out with a word, with a word. Jesus' authority over the demons is, is demonstrated. Let me put that up there again. Uh, he drove out the spirits with a word and, and healed all the sick. So his authority is an authority of, of the word. Now we've already seen Jesus can thwart the demonic in his encounter with Satan back in chapter 4. And what did Jesus rely on to silence Satan? The Word of God. Now it's the Word of Jesus that casts out demons. And we're going to see that again and again. That the Word of Jesus um, defeats the demonic and the evil. We always want to keep in mind the Word of God is power. The Word of God is not just information. When we open the Word, when we hear the Word, when we meditate on the Word, we are tapping into, we are opening ourselves up to God's power. Not in a magical way, but that God is work. God is there. God is present through His, through His Word by His Spirit. It's His power to reveal, to heal, to save, and in this case, to overcome evil. Okay, we'll talk more about demon possession in an upcoming Wednesday. Okay, but, but then Matthew also points out that Jesus healed all the sick that were brought to Him. Now, we've been given a sample of three, the leper, the centurion, and Peter's mother-in-law. These are told for a specific purpose, to reveal Jesus, his power, his heart, and his mission, and especially his, his um, ministry to all, and that what he's come to bring, the kingdom, is for all. Now, Matthew points this out, that Jesus did it many times <laughs> that evening. On this occasion, the whole the whole evening, he healed all the sick. Can you imagine the impact that had on Capernaum? In one night, all their sick are healed, from leprosy to paralysis to whatever other illnesses they had. No wonder Jesus became super famous. Okay, this is huge. Okay, let's go on to verse 17, and and we see uh, Matthew's explanation. This was, verse 17, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and he bore our diseases. Okay, you see there Matthew is pointing out specifically this is a fulfillment of 
prophecy. Okay, we just heard the, pow the power of the word of Jesus in overcoming the demonic as well as sickness. Now we hear about the power of the prophetic word. And we'll have more to say about that in an upcoming week as well. But it's huge in Matthew's gospel because Matthew is writing for Jews who know their Old Testament. Um, and so, um, you know, in a way, you get to really, that's why I keep pointing out these things from the Old Testament because you really got to have a, a certain familiarity with the Old Testament to, to get the full impact of what Matthew's doing. Um, if we didn't know about the, the Old Testament, the, 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 the Sinai Covenant restrictions that kept people away, then Jesus opening it up doesn't make as much impact. Okay? Now, but in quoting this verse, this is something that they do sometimes, mention one verse, but really what they want you to do is to recall the whole passage. When Jesus on the cross says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's recorded. Uh, he said that. He literally said that. He might have said more. He, the, the, it's in the text, and it's supposed to remind us of the entire 22nd Psalm. Okay, here, Matthew quotes this one section, but he's inviting his readers to recall all of Isaiah 53. That's where the quote's from. This is from Isaiah 53, 4. Okay, let's let's take a look at that context. Not the entire um, the entire chapter, but but uh, the verses that are right around here, right around that section. Now I'm going to point out before I read this that the wording is a little different. Okay, than than we just heard verse four. Um, the quote that we're just we're going to read now is from the current best Hebrew manuscripts of Isaiah 53, directly translated from Hebrew. Matthew was likely using a Greek translation that was in use at the time called the Septuagint, and he may have even been using his own translation, emphasizing the healing. So that's why the difference in the words, okay? But uh, regardless of the difference, um, it's making a really strong point about what this is all about. So Isaiah 53, 4 to 5, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. Okay, look at that. So Jesus came to do something about disease and illness. Isaiah 53, 5 states us directly, by his wounds we are healed. And this is not just spiritual. This is, is literal. Okay? Um, now one thing about, you know, well Jesus did all this by taking it all on himself. He died for our sins but he also bore the consequences of our sins, the punishment, the forsakenness by the Father, death itself, and illness itself. Jesus is the Savior of the total person, body and soul. We are saved by grace through faith in Christ, in body and soul, forgiven of our sins, and given eternal life in the resurrection. So what's, what's Matthew doing here? What's he doing here? By pointing this out. Okay, we, 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 here, here it is again. This was to fulfill what was spoken to the prophet of Isaiah. Matthew knows what the healings are all about. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, that the healings are previews of the results of what Jesus came to do, which will be culminated on the cross and in the resurrection. Okay? But the cross hasn't happened yet. Okay? We might not understand at this point. Matthew has just done a spoiler. Okay? By quoting Isaiah 53 and bringing to mind for his knowledgeable hearers, uh, for the Jews who know their Bible, bringing to mind not just that verse, but bringing this to mind. Oh, Jesus is taking up our infirmities and healing our diseases. He's taking up our pain and bore our suffering. How is he going to do that? 
He's going to be pierced for our transgressions. He's going to be crushed for our iniquities. He's going to have the punishment that brings us peace. And our healing is coming as a result of all that. Ooh, there's a preview. That this healing that Jesus is so freely giving away is going to have an enormous cost. Piercing crushed death so so matthew is 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 grounding this healing in the cross as we 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 talked about you know a couple weeks ago it is the cross because jesus has come to undo all the effects of the fall and this is what he's done by the cross by the resurrection. Okay, but then then why do I still get sick? Okay? If Jesus has died and risen again, why do I still have to deal with illness and disease and death? Did Jesus conquer it or not? Well, here's the deal. We live in the tension between the now and the not yet blessings that we have now because of the death and resurrection of Christ and there are blessings we look forward to not yet are they ours even though they have been bought and paid for by the death and resurrection let's look at it in terms of sin and forgiveness what do I have now and what do I have not yet now because of the death and resurrection of Christ I am forgiven I am justified I am right with God. I have no fear of the last judgment because I have been given the righteousness of Christ. My transgressions and iniquities pierced and crushed him on the cross, as we just heard, so they will never pierce and crush me. I am forgiven, declared righteous now. That's what I have now, okay? But there's a not yet. I still sin. <laughs> I still have a sinful nature. The Spirit may give me victory over certain specific sins, enabling me to change and to grow and to live a more Christ-like life in certain areas of my life, but I will still be a sinner with a fallen nature until I die. Not yet am I righteous in myself. I am declared righteous now, but I am not yet righteous in myself. Make sense? Okay, now, now, why did God do it this way? Why the now and the not yet? Ah, that's a whole other topic, but I'll say this. Because in his wisdom, which is infinitely greater than mine, he wills it to be so. And it must be because his plan is best for his glory, our good, and his mission. He's God, I'm not. Okay, now let's look at the now and not yet in terms of the body and healing. What do I have now, and what do I have not yet? Now, I have the promise of resurrection. I have the promise of complete restoration in the new creation and a forever without any disease or sickness or death. That is my possession now. I have the knowledge that I will live eternally in the presence of my Savior, even if I die physically. I have a, this is a certain gift that nobody can take away now. Not yet, I have this. <laughs> I am not yet restored and resurrected. And just as I keep sinning because I have a sinful fallen nature, I keep getting sick because I have a fallen body. And eventually I will die. Now occasionally Christ may give a miraculous healing for a specific illness just as he may give victory over a specific sin. But we are still mortal, and we will still die. Not yet are we resurrected. So both of these aspects of salvation, body and soul, are accomplished for us by the cross and resurrection and given to us. Now we have some of it. Not yet do we have it all. This is so important in understanding the tension of the life we live now. And this is what makes living in a fallen world a challenge. 
It calls for what? How do we live in the now and the not yet? Faith. Faith in the word of our Savior that his word defines reality. And isn't that always his goal? His goal is our growth in faith, trusting in him. Okay, there's something else. Um, there's another connection to the, to the now I just want to point out. Um, because my resurrected body is eternal, it shows that the body is, is sacred. God's, we've pointed that out before, God's long-range eternal plan for us is not an ethereal floating around spiritually on the clouds. It's a body. The body is sacred. So I take care of my body now because it's going to be resurrected in the not yet. Um, this is also why Christians have been interested in healing from the beginning and not just in the miracle healings, and you know, big, big production faith healing. No, 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 no. But doctors, nurses, clinics, hospitals. So I mean, so many hospitals and clinics and important medical things throughout the centuries have been done by Christians. Um, big part of the growth of the early church was that the Christians cared for people when a plague came and everybody else fled town. Just. So many, how many hospitals started by, in our own town? Queen of the Valley Hospital started by the Sisters of Saint o of, of Orange, uh, Saint Helena, Seventh Day Adventist. You know, so much of historically healthcare is tied to the Christian faith. It's grounded in the sanctity of life, the image of God, and the hope of the resurrection. So, interesting things to keep to keep in mind: the now and the not yet. That the part of our faith because we trust in God's word that the not yet is coming we live our lives in light of it okay all right so Christ died for your sins and for your healing may he give you health and healing in this life but may he also give you the peace that comes from the hope that the complete healing of the resurrection is yours for Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just praise you for this healing that, that uh, is ours in the not yet. The resurrection, the eradication of all illness for eternity. But Lord, we pray that you uh, work in us above all the peace that comes from faith and trusting this word to be true. But Lord, as the leper came to you asking for healing, as the centurion came asking on behalf of others, uh, we do pray, Lord, pray for healing, as we'll be praying in a little bit. We pray, Lord, that you do grant healing in the now as a sign of your faithfulness, as a sign and a preview of the healing that we will experience in the resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen.